So it's time for me to actually hand over to the man of the hour. Please join me in welcoming back Chris Grandison, uh, author of The Racial Hierarchy, Anti-Black Misculture and Anti-Black Racism. Uh, sorry, one moment, my screen's just gone blank. Hold on. Okay, so it's a pleasure to have you back. It is his book upon which this series is based. And for those of you who don't yet own a copy, I'd highly recommend so that you can read further into the all theories that we are being presented with. So without further ado, please join me in just giving a very warm virtual welcome to Chris Grandison. So Chris, I'm gonna hand over to you now. Thank you, thank you. Nice to be back and uh, really excited about this week. If there's one thing I wanted you to take from this whole lecture series, this one and the last one, it would be for us to understand uh, Neo Group Selection. Because once we understand that, I think a lot of our strategies, what we're trying to do as a community, as a people, um, it would change. And I know probably for everyone, it's, it's a new term, right? I think everyone knows racial mass incarceration, but once you get this neo group selection thing, uh, then you're going to understand uh, this, this big game that you're born into, that every single one of us is playing, every human on the planet, and we always have been, and very few of us even really know. But um, Let's get started. So uh, let's see. Um, so I've got this, this canister here filled with these, these different sized balls. And this is a selection process is taking place here where the smaller balls are being selected for. So they can pass through all of these levels because there's different size holes in each level. But the bigger balls are being selected against and the bigger the ball the less progress they make in in this canister and we use this as a visual aid to show uh, what natural selection and the other forms of selection we use in evolution kind of what it looks like because sometimes when we say selection people don't really get what we're talking about so here's another visual aid this is natural selection so i'm just going to quickly explain it do this visual image here this is natural selection as given to us by Charles Darwin. So we've got this group of deer in image number one, where there are dark and light colored deer. And then they begin a migration and they go over this, this mountain range, it's freezing cold and high and there's not much food and so on. And then when they get to their destination, you see eventually there's a lot more dark deer and a lot less lighter colored deer. So what happened is, through the migration over the mountains, it was hostile. It was a real hostile environment. But the darker deer seemed to have some genetic adaptations that could help them survive that hostile environment. But the lighter deer, they didn't. So a lot of them died. So now when you get to the other side and the dark deer start reproducing, you have much more dark deer on the other side and a lot less light deer. So we would say that the environment selected for the dark deer and against the lighter skinned ones. So something in that environment was choosing against the lighter ones, but it was helping the darker ones, or the dark ones at least had what it takes to survive. So this is kind of like what this visual aid does as well. It shows who's getting through and who can't. But the lighter balls, they're not being given any resistance. They can make it all the way through, but the bigger balls, well, they're struggling. The bigger they are, the more resistance they receive to make any progress in this canister. And what I'm going to show you tonight is black people are like those big balls at the top. The society kind of selects against them in various different ways. So it makes their way harder to go in society and other groups, they're going to move through much easier. It's a lot easier for them to get through this society. So the, the way I've chosen to kind of represent it and make it kind of easy is I've used sports teams, uh, the leagues they're in, and then the sports table. So if we take the sports team, so I've got Arsenal here or, or the Lakers. So that's like your, your tribe, your ethnic group, your nation or, or your, your, racial, your racial grouping, right? So they're all competing against each other in this league. So if you're all in the same nation, nation equals the league. So you've got all these teams competing to do well in the league. And of course, when you do well, you're at the top of, of the ranking table. And when things don't go too well, you're at the bottom. So what I'm trying to say here is in many instances, uh, the black population, certainly in the Western nations, they tend to be at the bottom of those league tables and at the top 
of the league tables, you'd find, you know, the white sports team, the black sports teams at the bottom and some of the other ethnic groups uh, are in the middle, Asians or Latinos. So you could say that this league is selecting for or against based on what your tribe is. So, you know, this cultural group selection, each tribe or racial grouping or ethnic group, they will have a culture. And the practices, the social norms in this culture lead them to either do well or not so well in that league. But now there's other things going on as well. So it's not just your cultural practices, there's lots of other factors as well. And the one we're gonna focus on tonight will be some of the discriminatory practices that take place and how neo-group selection kind of explains this process, how we do it, why we do it, what are the consequences, what are the rewards. So this is a historical representation of, of cultural group um, selection. So you had Native Americans here in the Americas for 15, 20,000 years. They had no contact with Asia or Europe. The, the big oceans kept them isolated. So as tribes, they would be competing against themselves. They'd have their tribal conflicts over territory and so forth. So there was still cultural group selection going on. But then we had the big meeting between Native Americans on the East Coast and then uh, the Western Europeans, so the French, the Dutch, the English, the Spanish. Now, when the Western Europeans came, they had all these cultural skills, not just from Western Europe, but they had everything they learned from ancient Egypt and Persia and um, ancient India and China and, and Greece. So they had the collected cultural information of all these Eurasian, North African civilizations. So they had the algebra and the writing and all of those things, but the Native Americans, they only had the cultural skills that were local, maybe just to the Northeast of America or the East Coast. So they didn't have the knowledge of the Aztecs or the Inca down in Central or South America because of the North-South orientation of North America and South America. Whereas the Eurasian landmass is more lateral it makes information and cultural transmission of all these useful techniques and innovations and skills and know-how. It made it easier to transmit all the way from China, all the way to France. So across the whole Eurasian landmass, knowledge was just being shared. Mongols, um, the Indus Valley culture, Babylonians, all of that. So all of that information is just building up. They would have what you would call cumulative cultural evolution. So when the Western Europeans met the Native Americans, they had this huge institutional, you know, competitive advantage with knowledge. You know, they came here, the Native Americans didn't go to Europe because the Europeans had the ships. Now those ships, they, they took Indian knowledge, they took Chinese knowledge, they took Arab knowledge. There's something called the Latin sail, which comes from Arabia. They wouldn't have really been able to make that journey without that type of sail. So they've got all this accumulated knowledge. Bottom line, when they came together, they had a huge competitive advantage and they could now easily outcompete the Native Americans. Now, if you look at this map with the American Indian reservations on it, this shows you the consequences of this intergroup competition. The Native Americans are now restricted to those purple areas and the rest of the land, the entire continent belongs to now the Europeans who came and settled. And this is how cultural competitions um, play out, but also neo-group selection because the Native Americans, they, they, um, they're enjoying the worst of kind of what society has to offer. So neo-group selection, it, it uses each tribe, if they have the power, they use what's highlighted there in red. So through forms of cultural and institutional discrimination that we're all familiar with, Tribes use racism, religious intolerance, xenophobia, nationalism, and ethnocentrism as a group behavioral strategy. It's like a, a tool that you use if you have it to compete against the other groups. And if you've got more of it, then you're gonna be the dominant one. So you're gonna control those other tribes and you're gonna use those skills to do it. So the results of the process is that these tribes can be said to have been selected or chosen for superior or inferior access to the best education, housing, employment, medical care, and the worst treatment by the criminal justice system. This is, is what the process can play out for you 
when you're selected against. Now, obviously, if you're selected for, uh, you get the best of everything. But this is a part of our tribal behavioral st strategy. We, we are group living, social primate, and we've got this coalitional tribal psychology. And unconsciously and consciously, we tend to behave this way to other large groups that may be challenging us for the good stuff in the local area. So this is a, a quote from Martin Daly's book here, which is a really good book, which comes very much in handy when we do the violence lecture. Uh, that will be lecture number five, so two lectures down the road. But um, this quote from him, really informative. Uh, human beings have evolved to be effective competitors. Now this is against each other. So individually, but also by group. And we do this by promoting our own fortunes. But what we're gonna talk about a lot tonight is how we undermine the fortunes of those who challenge us, our rivals, the other teams, or, or individually. So I've given us a, a nice little example here. This is how it can play out in your everyday life. So we've got these two ladies on the side here, and they're both interested in this nice, marriageable black male. Educated, got a job, no criminal record, real eligible um, black guy. Now, just promoting their own fortunes would be, you know, um, spending time with him, being nice to him, trying to gain his attention so, you know, that he would choose uh, to want to be with them. But the other woman's doing the same thing. So now it's a competition for him. But now let's say one of these women now starts spreading rumors about the sexual reputation of the other. You know, she sleeps around, she's not loyal. You know, so you want to destroy the sexual reputation of the other woman so that now this man can find out and he will be less likely to choose her because she's got this bad social sexual reputation. That would be undermining the fortunes of your rivals. That's doing something nasty to beat out you know, the other person in the race for, for the resource. And of course, this is something that really does play out you know, a lot um, in, in our um, world, but this is an individual scenario but it also plays up to the, the biggest groupings that we have on our planet. So if you're aware of um, this big Chinese technological um, giant, Huawei, they provide a lot of the um, communications equipment around the world to lots of countries and corporations and so forth. So now we're switching over to 5G and Huawei have the best 5G equipment um, on the planet. But America has been going around to all its allies now saying, don't buy your 5G equipment from Huawei because they're gonna use, the Chinese government's gonna use the equipment to spy on your government and get your secrets and all those kinds of things. So they're trying to destroy the reputation of Huawei and thus um, weaken China as well because the more big technological corporations they have, it will then challenge the big corporations in America. So, but the real reason they're attacking the reputation of the rival is the United States has commercial concerns. Um, if Huawei builds a country's 5G network, that country is likely to choose Huawei to upgrade those systems when newer technologies become available, thus continuing to strengthen this Chinese technological giant. And that's of course gonna exclude the US companies potentially um, for decades. Now, keep in mind that most of these countries are already used in Huawei for 4G and 3G. So they're just kind of upgrading to 5G. But America is trying to squeeze them out, you know, in their race to continue to try to restrict China from challenging America as the top nation state with the big companies and the economics and so, so on. So this takes us to this great African-American scholar, uh, Jim Sedanius, and with his colleague, Felicia Prato, uh, they came up with social dominance theory a little over 30 years ago. And his theory um, basically catalogued and found all kinds of evidence for this group selection behavior pattern. And over 30 years, they've got all these studies. They wrote this book about 20 years ago, but they've got a, a hat full of studies to support this cross-culturally, which is great. So it's not just in one country. They've gone to Australia and Asia and Europe and Africa and They've got all this great research to back up this theory. And this theory basically shows how groups try to outcompete and dominate each other and put other groups in a subordinate position to them because of the benefits and advantages you get 
from being in, in the dominant position. So here is, is, is his social dominance theory, some aspects of it. He defined it as negative social value, disproportionately left to or forced upon members of subordinate groups in the forms of substandard housing, disease, underemployment, distasteful work, punishment, just a lot of the bad outcomes in a society that you don't want your, your community to have, you can be forced into it or you can be outcompeted into it. So an example would be the way where Native Americans are now compared to European Americans. But through their cross-cultural research, they found this behavior pattern is, is universal. Uh, they found group-based hierarchical organization of societies across the planet and historical examples as, as well. And here's what happens when you win. So the, the members of dominant social groups enjoy disproportionate share of positive social value, desirable material, symbolic resources, the political power, all the institutional power, protection by force, good housing, health care, the lot. This is just a tribe winning. When you have these cultural competitions and, and your cultural group through their social norm practices and through what you do to undermine your rivals, you're, you're winning. If you're getting all those things there that we see at the bottom, that's dominance, that's winning. And now you know why you have that behavior pattern because if you're gonna get all these good outcomes, yeah, that's good reason um, to go ahead and compete and fight and challenge others because of the benefits you get at the end of the process. And like you said, this is across the planet. They found evidence for this on every continent amongst just everyone, past and present. Now I got the idea to go ahead and put it in my book when I read this book by this evolutionist, he's a top endocrinologist, Robert Sapolsky. And uh, he had a section in his book where he wrote about neogroup selection. He says it plays out with great frequency and consequence in humans. Now, if we say, well, why do humans have this behavior pattern? And he's showing you right there at the la latter part of his statement, groups compete for hunting grounds, pastures, water sources, shelter. So this has been going on for hundreds of thousands of years. And for something so important, um, you're going to have selection now. The groups that did well at it got more territory, got the best water sources and so on, created more children, had more food to feed their families, so they would grow. And whatever biological foundation there was for this group behavioral pattern, that would grow as well, because the people who were winning had that strategy. So eventually, you just get a whole bunch of winners who all follow that type of strategy and it now becomes like a human instinct. So here he, he says, cultures magnify the intensity of between group selection and lessen within group selection. So let me explain those two bits there. So let me start with lessening within group selection. On your team, you, you want teamwork, you want cooperation. You don't wanna be fighting or competing with other members of your team. So the more positive you're responding to those who look like you on the same team as you, that's reducing selection within the team. That's making you just one harmonious team that operates very well. Now the between group selection is now when those harmonious teams are now competing against each other and the ones with the best strategies and techniques, that will be the team that is selected for and enjoys the good stuff and the team that's been selected against well, you head down to the bottom of the ranking table, but that's the selection process that takes place between groups. Now, in our world, in our society, in our modern world, this is where the ethnocentrism and the race-based politics comes in, because you can use those tools to win your cultural competition. So this is a good example of that competition. Now, in the first lecture series we did last year, I had a whole lecture on white supremacy as a cultural construct. And that's what it does. It's the cultural construct they use to compete against other groups. So if we go back to the Native American example again, white people were supporting each other, cooperating in competition against Native Americans. And the Native Americans were supporting themselves in going against uh, the white settlers. But it's eventually one that they lost 
to the group with the superior cooperation and of course the knowledge and logistics and all these things that the white supremacy construct had going for it. And that was basically the end of Native American dominance in the Americas. And of course, the same thing happened in the Caribbean and Australia and so on. The cultures come together, they compete, you got a winner and you got a loser. So this is a cultural system where the vast majority share the biases, same biases and worldviews. And this enables that high level of collective cooperative behavior, at least in the racial context. So they can have their other ways where they compete against each other. The French can fight the English and all those kinds of stuff. But when it comes to dealing with the Native Americans, well, they were kind of on the same page there. They saw them as an inferior race and you don't deserve this land and we're going to go at you and take it from you. And the Native Americans came back at them and fought to try and hold it. But it's a competition and competitions have winners and losers. But the cultural system, those biases and worldviews and stuff, it creates a cultural psychology. And this can help them now have this high level of cooperation, trust, and collective action towards going at whatever the other cultural group is, whether it's Australian Aborigines or the Native Americans, you know, in, in America. And so this is another example of it. So the cooperation here is if you're white, you can get the nice water, you can sleep in that hotel, you can go in the pool, you can sit wherever you want to on the bus. That will be cooperation and pro-social behavior towards members of your own tribe. So this is how white supremacy is a culture where you're supporting the other white members of the team. So all the other good things in that society, white people have access to it. But in the Jim Crow, you know, apartheid that America had, well, you saw there the colored, they get the substandards, they get less, they can't go in that hotel, they can't go to that pool, they can't get that job. They're being restricted to the lower levels of that society. So they're being selected against and white people are being selected for, and that's all because they had the cultural dominance and the cooperation as a group. So cooperation and pro-sociality towards the members of your team, it really helps you compete very well against another group, other teams, other cultures, um, because the other cultures may not be cooperating very well with each other. They may not be as pro-social towards each other as your team is being towards the other members of your team. And that helps you to outcompete the other tribes. And this is a very good um, example to use because it's, it's a, a, a pretty stunning um, example of an effective uh, group strategy highly competitive group strategy. So this is, is from my book here, the um, quote I've got. We need to look at white supremacy a little bit differently than we do. We, we think about it morally and ethically, and we want to challenge it morally and ethically. And fine, go ahead and keep doing that. But in my opinion, that's the wrong way to go. It's the other team, it's the strategy they use so that their team can win. Now, you're not going to talk somebody out of stop doing something that is extremely beneficial to them. The settlers out of Western Europe are the ruling class on several continents that they do not come from. Australia, North and South America. They're not indigenous to those lands, but they dominate them. And that's through the cultural strategies that they practice. Now, when you have these kinds of benefits, where you're on the top, enjoying the best that a society has to offer, and you're from one continent, but you're now you're controlling four, you're not going to talk anybody out of that. So when you have some idea of how you know, our evolved nature works, and, and you look at the super beneficial aspects of the culture of white supremacy, supremacy for the white tribe, when you look at it from an evolutionary perspective, your strategies are going to be different in how you deal with it. I'm not going to your institution and telling your judges and your employment sector, please treat me better. Please stop doing this to me. Please stop doing that to me. You haven't understood the point. They're, they're, they're doing that on purpose to get the best of what that society has to offer. Now, to be fair, this is not a white thing. This is a homo sapien thing, right? We all have our cultural strategies. As groups, we're all competing against each other. Some strategies are going to be better than others. It's going to have better outcomes. But if you kind of don't really understand the game you're in, you're not even thinking about promoting that high level of cooperation and pro-sociality 
towards your own team so that your team can compete better at a higher level to get better outcomes in competition with what other groups are doing. So this is Pascal Boyer. And in his book, which came out about three years ago, he picks up where Jim Sidanis' work left off. And he makes the comment that basically just explains what we've just been through. What drives people's behavior is a coalitional situation. So think of that as a tribal rivalry type of situation. It could be nation state, could be community, ethnic group, racial ethnic, doesn't matter. It's a coalitional situation, it's group to group. So what drives our behavior is a coalitional situation where it seems advantageous to try and keep members of other groups in a lower status position with distinctly worse outcomes on the basis of this intuition, this instinct that the welfare of different groups is a zero sum game. If we're on top and they're making gains, that's a problem because they must be taking a bite out of us to be making those gains. That's what that zero sum relationship implies. So this is where we get, you know, this from. So yes, it is human nature. Everyone does it. But this 2011 study um, and many others, if we look at the, the demographics lecture we did last year, I put lots of these studies in there where they would test white people for perceptions of the demographic change that taking place. Whites see racism as a zero sum game that they are now losing. So I've got this picture of the January 6th thing that happened in America because the election didn't go their way. Uh, most white people vote Republican. Republicans lost. And now they're with the demographic change that's taking place and the feeling that we are losing our level of dominance. They started to get on bad. Democracy is not working. We need something else because the bottom line is we want to stay in a dominant position. And if democracy doesn't help us do that, then to hell with democracy. And this is why you see these problems taking place across several Western democracies now, where you got the populists and these strongman leaders come in, becoming more popular. And we ask you, what's wrong with people? Can't they see what these guys are? But these guys are telling them what they want to hear. So this is another quote from my book. Many whites view status gains by blacks and other minorities as a zero sum gain. When minorities gain, some white people feel they're losing their standing and superior control of the good stuff. The good stuff being all those things we talked about that you get from having that dominant position um, in society. So again, to be fair, this is not a white people thing, it's a homo sapien thing, but they are in the dominant position. So they are the ones who feel now under threat. You know, if you're in the back and you're catching up, you're not feeling under threat, you're feeling good, you're making gains. But if you're in the dominant position and, and you see those folks behind you making gains, now you're feeling um, threatened. So a couple of weeks ago, when we did the races, the social construct um, lecture, we talked about this, right? How the social media and the demographic change and the fears, white fears of losing dominance, um, being replaced and displaced by other people, black or whoever, we had this guy in New Zealand who went and shot up the mosques and killed those people and live streamed it. And he was influenced by social media white supremacists like this guy, Stan Molyneux. And little did I know, even though I said there would be more, I didn't know it was going to be two days later. Because we did this, I think, on the 12th and then on the 14th, we had this, this guy in Buffalo go live stream himself with nigger written on his rifle, go into this supermarket here and shoot as many black people as he could find because he's afraid that black people and latinos and whoever are reproducing too fast and are replacing the white race but it's it's that fear of losing that dominant position you're in why we have this type of behavior and yes he's some type of mentally disturbed person but there's a whole lot of mentally disturbed people out there and and this is just the extreme what's not what will not be extreme is the everyday discrimination that will increase because of this fear and feeling of threat. So that will be hitting us in the employment sector or in healthcare or in education. They don't have to go around shooting people, but there will be people who just feel more threatened by people of color increasing in different places in society where they didn't see them before. It's this feeling of, of threat. 
Now, there are many other factors that can play a role in how this neo-group selection takes place, how these competitions are won or lost. So first of all, you've got to look at your cultural practices and your social norms. This is basically how effective is your teamwork going to be? It's going to be based on the cultural practices and social norms. And no one's perfect there. And you have to have, you know, the courage to look at yourself and say, okay, we've got some problems. We're not doing A, B, and C very well. And that's part of the reason we're losing. It's part of the reason we're not doing as well. And we've got to fix that. And some of us in, in our community don't want to do that. They always want to make it external, as in it's always a racial discriminatory argument why something may not be going well for us. Yes, the discriminatory practices are there, but you absolutely have to look at your practices and social norms. How well your team, your society works is based on what you're looking at right there. But we've also got issues with assimilation. So when I've used the child developmental psychology studies showing black children four, five, and six talking about how bad it is to be black, how negative it is, how they're the unintelligent ones, they're the ugly ones, they're the badly behaved ones. This is assimilating into Western society and then internalizing these negative perceptions of your own race. That now can harm performance. So you do have to ask yourself, what are you assimilating into? Is it adaptive? Is it maladaptive? If it's maladaptive, we're responsible for doing something about that. If we know this anti-blackness culture is embedded in Western culture, and then we are, allow ourselves to assimilate into it, we're also drinking in that anti-black culture and it will harm us. That hurts your trust, your cooperation, your teamwork, as we saw in the colorism lecture and several other of the lectures from last year. Now there are ecological factors as well, and we'll get into both of those in the two following lectures. So we're gonna do um, the sex ratio problem in two weeks, and then we're gonna do violent social competitiveness and discriminating ecologies. So ecological factors can be external, but they can put pressure on you and cause you to behave in some very bad ways, but you don't necessarily control the ecology. But we have to be aware of the ecology so that then we can start to have defensive strategies um, to deal with it. Level of pro-social behavior. So this is whether you have high or low levels of trust and cooperative behavior within your group. And uh, I talked about that a lot in, in a past um, prior lecture, but so I use white supremacy as an example of high level pro-social behavior towards each other, certainly in a racial context, as in I'm going to hire the white guy, not going to hire the Asian or the black guy. That's pro-social behavior where I'm behaving well towards members of my own team so my team can win. And intergroup competition, um, you have to face facts. Every team has its culture. And when you come together and start playing each other, if you get beat, you get beat. Now you have to ask yourself questions. Why were we beaten? So yes, there's external stuff going on. But as I said at the top, what about your practices? Are you doing what you need to do to perform better? Because there are no perfect cultures. So there's always improvement to be made. And you may have some dysfunctional practices there. And of course, all of these things can combine to operate together. So there are many other factors at play, not just the discriminatory factor at play. And I dealt with that in this lecture last year. The, I think it's still available on Nigel's website, but it's on my YouTube page as well. And also in the Afro Future Worldview, we talked a lot about what pro-sociality is and how we need to do a lot more of it if we want to compete as a team and have better outcomes. High levels of pro-social behavior towards each other is absolutely what we need um, to have better outcomes. So, these are important areas of, of our society. And if racism is involved in racial variation in these areas, then a selection process is in effect and obviously has been in effect for a long time. So if racial discrimination is playing a role in, let's say, the employment sector or healthcare, then we're being selected against. We will have worse outcomes in those areas. And there may be other factors but we know racism is a factor in these very important areas. So that's somebody holding you back at the line and letting someone else get a head start if they are not meeting with the same discriminatory practices in those areas. They may, they may be actually even be getting treated very, very well or better in those areas. 
But this now creates the selection process where we're being held back and the others, they can make it all the way down to the bottom of that, of that canister. So uh, if, if you're still a bit confused, we're all, almost at the question and answer section now for part one. I'm hoping I explained it well enough that, that you get this process that is always on. It's never off. It's been in operation for hundreds of thousands of years and it's still in full effect right now and as a race we have gotten the very bad end of the stick when it comes to neo group selection so that's the end of, of part one